The next few moments is devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood in order to utilize the standard operating procedure of 1 John 1, 9, which states, If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity we have this evening to study your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us in regards to these things which we are about to study. In Christ's name, amen. Last time we left off with the doctrine of the Trinity. Now we noted that the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. It's not found in the Old or New Testament. It is a technical theological word that was coined in the 4th century A.D. and is used to describe a theological concept. The doctrine of the Trinity recognizes God as being one in essence, yet three in persons. And these three persons possess equal, perfect, eternal, and infinite, identical essence. We have not as of yet studied the essence of God, but that will be forthcoming after our uh, some other uh, studies that we need to get under our belt first. And then we'll get to the essence of God, and you will understand that the essence of God, it's equal among all three members, among God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is used to describe three persons in one Godhead. <clears throat> There is only one divine nature or being. Now, uh, March 17th, that's St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick uh, used the three-leaf clover, not the four-leaf, but the three-leaf clover to describe the Trinity to those he was giving the milk of the word. So he would hold up the uh, three-leaf clover, very common in uh, Ireland, and the places he went to uh, be a missionary. And he would hold it up, and he would say, this is one clover, yet there are uh, three leaves. And this indicates the Trinity, one in essence, yet three persons. So the divine being is tri-personal, involving distinctions between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These three persons are joint partakers of exactly the same nature and majesty of God. There is one true God, but in the unity of the Godhead, there are three co-equal and co-eternal persons. Now, of course, we were attacked on September 11th. You don't have to be reminded of that. It's uh, probably still fresh in our memories, even though it's been years since that day. We were attacked by Muslims. Muslims do not believe in the Trinity. They think that our belief in a Trinity is polytheism. So they think of us as degenerate uh, Greeks. As the Greeks worship many gods, they believe we worship many gods, but uh, try to cover this up by saying, well, it's the Trinity. So uh, they do not understand this as unbelievers. Uh, they have a very hard time with the Trinity, and uh, one of the hardest groups of people to witness to or to evangelize or do mission work would be the Muslims because they are extremely anti-Christian and uh, anti-Semitic, which makes them a very evil group of people, and their souls have been so clogged with evil. They are one of the hardest groups of people to get the gospel to, yet some, uh, very few, uh, do respond to the gospel. So the Trinity is a revealed doctrine. This means that it is undiscoverable by natural reason. Through religion or through natural reason, the religion of the Muslims, uh, for example, they cannot uh, reconcile the fact that there is a Trinity. Uh, They think of that as evil polytheism, but it's not because the Trinity is a revealed doctrine and it can only be discovered through the means of God the Holy Spirit who teaches us these things. Since each person of the Trinity has the same essence, God is described as one, but they are uh, three uh, distinct 
persons. <clears throat> Distinctions are made between the members of the Trinity. We can find this in 2 Corinthians 13:14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, and the love of God, the first member of the Trinity, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, be with all of you. The word Trinity, let's get into some church history. The word Trinity was first used by Tertullian in the second century to designate a biblical doctrine. The doctrine of the Trinity was confirmed by the Council of Nicaea in A.D. 325. After much controversy, including the heresy of Arius, Sabellius, and Paul of Samosata, they finally came to a correct understanding of the doctrine. Therefore, the doctrine of the Trinity the Trinity is defined as, you can write this down, the doctrine of the Trinity is defined as, God is one in essence but three, co-equal, co-eternal, and co-infinite persons. God is one in essence but three, co-equal, co-eternal, and co-infinite persons. Now I have here an egg. And um, as I showed you yesterday, an egg, when you crack the egg, you will see that it has a shell and the whites and the yolk. Now, this is an imperfect illustration, but it is an illustration nonetheless. An egg is an egg, yet it's composed of three distinct parts. <clears throat> a better analogy will be light, and we will get to that, uh, because uh, this illustration is used by the Bible itself, and we will get to this shortly. Uh, for the reason of the Trinity, we first find uh, that there is a Trinity by the plural pronouns used for God. That plural uh, pronoun, Elohim. This implies that there is uh, more than one person in the Godhead. And the singular noun is Yahweh. That's the sacred tetragrammaton, J-H-W-H, which could not be pronounced in the Old Testament due to the holiness of the name. Yahweh, Adonai, Yahweh, or Jehovah, is used to distinguish between the persons. Elohim emphasizes the one essence of God, and Jehovah emphasizes one person in the Trinity, and usually in the Old Testament this was God the Son. There is a scriptural verification of this. The plural pronoun for God, Elohim, was used in Genesis 1.26 and Genesis 3.22, where it says, Let us make man. Notice the plural pronoun, us. And in Isaiah 6.8, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And there we have the plural uh, pronoun used in Isaiah 6.8. Psalms 110, verse 1. The Lord, this is God the Father, said to my Lord, this is God the Son. And this is David speaking. And therefore, uh, this is a verse, Psalms 110, 1, that our Lord Jesus Christ used when uh, the legalist and the self-righteous religious leaders wanted to argue with him. And that's because uh, they did not uh, comprehend the idea of the Trinity. And this was uh, Jesus Christ's way of saying there is a trinity. So when uh, Jesus Christ said in John 10.30, he said to the crowd, I and the Father, I and the Father are one. Now to the crowd, this seemed like utter blasphemy because they did not understand the trinity and the fact that there were three and are, always has been, three members of of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And therefore, he was, uh, he was uh, classified as a blasphemer. And yet, if they had uh, the spiritual knowledge, they would have understand from the Old Testament that, in fact, there is the Trinity, and they would have known that from the plural use of Elohim. In John 14:16, this is another scriptural verification. It says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, he abides with you and will be in you. So we see here the distinction between the Holy Spirit and God the Father. So that's enough scriptural verification. There are other verses. Uh, you can write them down if you uh, wish to look them up later. Uh, one of them, John 10:28. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord, my God. Uh, this is an indication he's using uh, 
the fact that uh, the Lord and His uh, humanity, and then that it was uh, my God. So we see distinctions all through Scripture. First Corinthians twelve four through six, Second Corinthians thirteen fourteen, First Peter one two, Revelation one. 4 through 6. If you want to write those down, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, 1 Peter 1, 2, and Revelation 1, 4 through 6. That will give you enough uh, scriptural clarification to the fact that there is the existence of the Trinity. So though one in essence, God is three in persons. So in the doctrine of the unity of God, there is only one essence or substance, and we will, of course, get to the study of the essence of God. Yet there is the individuality of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and this is uh, preserved against the heresy that arose that there are only modes of God. This idea is a false doctrine that dates back to the 500s A.D., and it, it implies that God has various modes for uh, various purposes in dealing with man, whether it be in creation or in salvation, and that was a false doctrine, and that has uh, since been cleared up. So God is one, yet in himself, and from all eternity past, he is three separate and distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. So we noted through an argumentation that, of course, there is the existence of the Trinity by the use of the plural noun Elohim uh, as opposed to the singular noun of Yahweh, which usually referred to God the Son. So we're going to uh, continue now, and uh, let's take a look at the distinctive functions of the Trinity. Actually, each person of the Godhead has a different purpose and a different function. Uh, let's look at the first one. While the Bible distinguishes between the members of the Trinity, it refers to the activity of spirit specific persons in the Godhead. This is a point, point one. While the Bible distinguishes between the members of the Trinity, it refers to the activity of specific persons in the Godhead. Point two. All three members of the Trinity provided salvation. All three members of the Trinity provided salvation. Let's look at the functions in this uh, providing of salvation. First of all, God the Father planned salvation. God the Father planned salvation. This is as per Isaiah 14.27, John 4.34, John 5.17, uh, John 12.44, 1 Corinthians 8.6, and Ephesians 3.11. God the Father planned salvation according to Isaiah 14:27, John 4:34, John 5:17, John 12:44, 4, 1 Corinthians 8:6 and Ephesians 3:11. God the Son executed salvation on the cross. God the Son executed salvation on the cross. This is found in John 4:34. God the Son executed salvation on the cross as per John 5.17. Uh, God the Son executed salvation on the cross as per 1 Peter 2.4, 1 Peter 3.18, Romans 5.8, and Hebrews 10.7. So we have noted that God the Father planned salvation and God the Son executed salvation. God the Holy Spirit reveals the message of salvation. So God the Holy Spirit is one who is the one who reveals to us the message of salvation. And this is under what we studied, common grace. I hope you remember that. Common grace, and of course we have efficacious grace. And therefore, God the Holy Spirit makes the gospel perspicuous. And these functions are found in John 16, 8 through 11. <coughs> so we have noted the distinct... Uh, the the, we have distinguished the uh, specific persons in the Godhead and the actual function in providing our very own salvation. So while this might, might sound tedious, it is very important as it is the basis of your very own salvation. So God the Father planned salvation and God the Son executed salvation and God the Holy Spirit reveals the message of salvation under the concept of the doctrine of common grace which you should still understand and if you don't it's on tape 
uh, basics lessons one and two deal with the common grace of God the Holy Spirit. Each person of the Trinity indwells the body of every church age believer. Now we'll get to this in a second. And that is each person of the Trinity indwells the body of every church age believer. This is something unique. And I'm going to hold off on this. And let's move on to the illustrations of the Trinity. And then when we get to the abode of God, we will have more to say about the fact that within us is the Trinity. So let's look at the illustration that's given in the scripture concerning the Trinity. The illustration given in the Bible is that of light. 1 John 1 5. And this is the message which we have heard from Him, and we communicate to you that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness. John 1 5. The light shined into darkness, and the darkness did not overpower it. Excuse me. <clears throat> John 8:12 Again therefore Jesus spoke to them saying I am the light of the world he who follows me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life 1 Timothy 6:16 6, Who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light whom no man hath seen nor can see to him be honor and eternal dominion amen <clears throat> Now I'm not saying amen just for the heck of it that's part of the scripture. <coughs> Excuse me. So light can be regarded from two different viewpoints. Light can be regarded from the standpoint of the colors of the spectrum, and there are many colors in the spectrum of light, and this illustrates the essence of God, which we will study in detail, and that will be forthcoming. Uh, the first point we need to make is that every ray of light from the sun is pure white and yet it contains all the colors of the spectrum in light waves or particles of light. And these particles of light operate on different waves, and this is the way in which we can distinguish color. All color in the world, therefore, depends upon light. When all light is reflected from the object, this is... Uh, this object will be white. And when light is absorbed in an object, this object is black. Therefore, we have the custom of, I believe it's after Easter, we uh, wear white and we uh, discontinue our wearing of black and it is more apropos to wear white and uh, lighter, lighter colors. Uh, that's why when you see people in a Hawaiian shirt, uh, it's colorful, but usually those colors are light so that the sun will be reflected off of uh, this clothing and the heat will not be absorbed and therefore uh, in the summertime especially here in the south you won't get uh, overly heated or too hot now I like the color black so in the summer you may see me wear black in fact you will uh, wear a black suit or something and uh, so I like I like to wear black. It's it's thinning for a man who has a pot belly. So you see that uh, we see this in in fact, and then after Labor Day, I think you're supposed to go back to wearing darker colors. Uh, in this case, ask the ladies at home when you get home if this is correct. All right. Every every ray of light has three primary colors, and you uh, probably learned this in middle school or. Uh, if you're from Alabama, you learned it in high school, and that, that, that was a joke. So you've learned this, uh, but you've probably forgotten. I've forgotten until I went over this. Uh, therefore, a ray of light has three primary colors. By the way, Alabama probably has a better educational system than South Carolina, so that wasn't fair of me to say. Uh, Louisiana, I believe, maybe that's the one that's uh, last on the totem pole. So the, they probably learned about the three primary colors in uh, uh, their senior year or maybe their freshman year of college. So every ray of light has three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. If you're from Louisiana and you ever get this tape, that was a joke. Just relax. 
but uh, that's not going to happen. So when a ray of light strikes an object so that the red and yellow are absorbed, the color reflected is blue. If the yellow and blue are absorbed, the color is red. So the three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. And when a ray of light strikes any object, certain parts are absorbed and certain parts reflected. It's simple. The secondary colors are orange, green, and purple. Red plus yellow, that's where we get the color orange. Blue plus yellow is where we get green. I don't really like the color green, but blue plus yellow equals green. Green in nature is fine, but uh, I have a green shirt and I, I wear it, but I don't like it. Uh, blue plus red equals purple. Blue plus red equals purple. purple. Therefore, every color in every ray, therefore, every color is in every ray of light. What colors are absorbed determine the color of an object as it reflects that light. So light from the standpoint point of color illustrates the essence of God. For just as God is one, light is one. However, light has many colors. Just as God has many different attributes in his essence, and we will study those attributes. Under certain conditions, you can see certain attributes of God. So light can be uh, regarded from the standpoint of its composition. And this is another way to look at the Trinity. Light can be regarded from the standpoint of its comp composition. Light is one substance, therefore when you say light, everybody knows what you're talking about. But light is composed of three different properties, just as the Trinity has three different persons. The properties are actinic, that's A-C-T-I-N-I-C, -I -I actinic. There is luminiferous, and there is calorific. Now that's not a new diet or a new uh, low-carb fad. Calorific. Uh, drink this shake three times a day and eat nothing and you will have a calorific diet and lose weight. So calorific, it's C-A-L-O-R-I-F-I-C and uh, this has nothing to do with calories. This has to do with the uh, properties, the different compositions of light. Actinic is a ray of light of short wavelengths that produces photochemical effects. You cannot see actinic light and you cannot feel actinic light. This is a uh, perfect illustration of God the Father. Luminiferous is light produced by the emission of light occurring at a temperature <clears throat> below that of incandescent bodies. So luminiferous is both seen and felt. This is a perfect illustration of God the Son. Luminiferous is both seen and felt. When our Lord, uh, our Lord can be both seen and felt when we go to heaven. Uh, calorific is light converted into heat. Calorific is light converted into heat. Calorific is not seen but felt, and this is a perfect illustration of God the Holy Spirit. But let me clear one thing up. When I say felt, uh, this is by way, by means of illustration. We do not feel actually emotionally the feeling or the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. Uh, what I'm saying by felt is uh, God the Holy Spirit actually teaches uh, to our human spirit and has a function in our spiritual uh, life. So uh, it has nothing to do with feeling, not in this dispensation. So let's get that straight because there's a lot of, of tendency in, around here and all over the country to have this uh, the, the holiness. Is it a holiness movement? I don't know. Pentecostal, that's what they call them. Pentecostals, the fastest growing uh, churches in America are Pentecostal and that shows, uh, uh, that's a definite sign of spiritual apostasy and it's a sad thing and we'll get to that and uh, you'll hear enough about this from me later so I'm not going to harp on it right now. So therefore we have the composition of light being, analog being analogous to the three persons in the Godhead who are one. Light is one with three different properties, actinic, luminifer luminiferous, and calorific. And uh, God is one in essence, yet three in persons. So we have the concept of the Trinity. As I've said, God is one in essence or substance. God
God is three equal, three co-equal, co-eternal, and co-infinite persons existing in eternity past and will exist forever. Co-infinite persons in that one essence. When divine essence is the subject, God is revealed as one. And when divine persons are the subject, God is revealed as three separate and distinct persons. The persons of the Godhead, there is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 uh, delineates the three members of the Godhead. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, and the love, of, love for God, that's God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, that's the third member of the Trinity, be with all of you. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called with refer reference to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, even the Father of all. So note this one baptism. This is not referring to ritual baptism. The one baptism is the baptism of God the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, even the Father of all. So listed in here are the three members of the Trinity. And the baptism is referring to the baptism of God the Holy Spirit, which is done at the moment of our salvation. It is not an emotional experience. It's something that God the Father has given to us, the baptism of God the Holy Spirit. So when you see in some verses in Matthew, and we'll get to those as well when we go over Matthew, it will say, uh, believe and be baptized. Well, the fact is, when you believe, as a result of your faith alone in Christ alone, you you are baptized by God the Holy Spirit. There is a ritual baptism that was used in the pre-canon period, and we'll study this in detail very shortly, probably beginning within the next half of this tape. So let's have a summary of the doctrine of the Trinity. This is a rather short doctrine. It's a simple doctrine, and it's one that uh, should be easily understood. The Trinity, therefore, as we noted, is not a biblical word, but rather a technical theological term used to designate the threefold manifestation of one God as Father, the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is not a biblical word, but a technical theological term used to designate the threefold manifestation of one God as Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. God is one in essence who exists eternally in three distinct, co-equal, co-eternal persons. God is one. That's found in Galatians 3.20 and James 2.19. But the Son, John 1.1 1, 1, and John 14.9 and Colossians 2.9 and the Spirit that's found in Acts 5, 3 through 4, 1 Corinthians 3.16. This is the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, Acts 5, 3 through 4, 1 Corinthians 3.16 are also fully God, yet they are distinct from the Father and from each other. The unified equality and yet distinction is seen in the Triactic reference, references to the three persons, which is noted in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, and Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, also 1 Peter 1, 2. The Old Testament reveals a plurality of persons in the divine nature through the name Elohim, as well as the plural pronouns of Genesis 1.26 and 11.7, the plural verbs of Genesis 11.7 and 35.7, the identity of the angel of the Lord as God in Exodus 3.2-6, Judges 13, 21 through 22, and the references to the Spirit in Genesis 1, 2, and Isaiah 63, 10. So these all add up to the fact that God is one in essence, but three separate and distinct personalities. So if I give you a test on, I won't, but if I were to give you a test on the Trinity, you should have a uh, pretty good grasp on it now. And in fact, I said, what's the Trinity? You hold up a three-leaf clover, and here's God the Son, God the Father, God, God the Holy Spirit. They are uh, one person with distinct uh, persons. They are uh, one in essence, uh, yet possess equal, perfect, and eternal, and infinite, identical essence. So these are the things that um, are simple. This is the milk of the Word. And uh, I, I, I believe that uh, just through this... Uh, tape here and through the verses that you've uh, written down 
uh, through the fact of the uh, Hebrew uses, usage of Elohim. I don't know if I spelled it. E-L-O-H-I-M. E-L-O-H-I-N. That's the plural. And then Yahweh, J-H-W-H, which also uh, translated Adonai, uh, Yahweh, or uh, Jehovah. And, uh, of course, that is singular. So we see one in essence, yet three uh, distinct uh, persons. So um, I think we've uh, pretty much covered all we need to cover concerning the Trinity. Very simple doctrine. And I doubt you should have any problems with this. If you do, just uh, keep rewinding the first half of this tape over and over again until you get it. And you might want to make sure you're filled with God the Holy Spirit. Oh, actually, you should make sure that you are, otherwise you probably won't understand it. So let's move on. Of course, we just studied the Trinity. Now, where does the Trinity reside? So we're going to begin the doctrine of the abode of God. That's A-B-O-D-E. That's where, where does God reside? The doctrine of the abode of God. God dwells in three places. God dwells in three places. God dwells in the universe. Now, God, of course, we just studied the Trinity. So you understand, this is the Trinity. God dwells in three places. Uh, the universe. The third heaven. And in the body of every church age believer. And notice that I... Uh, make a distinction between believers. Uh, God did not indwell the body of every Old Testament believer. God does not indwell the body of every tribulational saint. God does not indwell the body of every believer in the millennium. God only indwells the body of every church age believer. Now, this is phenomenal. We find this fact. We find that God the Father indwells us. This is taught in John 14, 23. God the Father indwells us, and this is taught in John 14, 23. God the Father indwells us is taught in Ephesians 4, 6. It's taught in 2 John 9. It's taught in Philippians 2, 13. The Father indwells as the author of our portfolio of invisible assets. Now, what does this mean? Well, of course, we just studied the Trinity, and that's why we follow up with the abode of God, because now you have a foundation. Now you might be, now you might are, be able to see why uh, I'm teaching in this method and going through these uh, different doctrines and why one has come before the other. That's because now you know that God the Father is the what? He is the author of the plan. And as the author of the plan, He has he is the author of our portfolio of invisible assets. Now they're invisible because it's spiritual. And, uh, and, and the Bible says by the fruit of their spirit uh, you will uh, know them or see them. The fruit is invisible. The fruit is invisible. We have uh, spiritual fruit, that is. We have invisible assets. Now, fruitcakes are not invisible. They're very visible. So you know when you run across a fruitcake. But you do not know uh, necessarily when you run across uh, one of the greatest believers ever. You would have no clue because it's invisible. The assets that we have are invisible, and these assets are available for us to use. Most of us do not use them, not, maybe not most of us here or most of us listening, but most of us in terms of the church do not use the invisible assets that we have. And God the Father is the author of these invisible assets, and God the Father indwells us. This is phenomenal. This is absolutely extraordinary. God the Father is also the grantor of our escrow blessings. Escrow blessings. These are We have escrow blessings for time. That is, when we go through the momentum testing, and you haven't studied this yet, but I'm gonna, I have to tell you these things as a, as a means of motivation. When, when you grow up spiritually and once you're uh, moving into adulthood, 
you will reach a point where you have the four stages of momentum testing people thought system and disaster people thought system and disaster testing when uh, you're in spiritual maturity you will face these tests in different forms each of us will have a different form uh, not, not all of us will have the same thing happen to us we'll have different things happen to us and that is a means by which we grow in grace and in knowledge because under testing we utilize the doctrines we have learned and when we do so, we receive, receive escrow blessings for time. Uh, by being spiritually mature, we have uh, uh, riches beyond what we could ever ask or think. Now, I'm not talking about material riches. A lot of people, uh, maybe some of you, are always constantly uh, seeking uh, the riches, the financial riches, the uh, wealth that can uh, be created here on earth through free free enterprise and um, and it's okay to uh, desire uh, these things as long as it's not an excessive uh, desire and in, in other words an inordinate that means excessive ambition now normal ambition where you go to your job and you work or if you have a normal ambition in a business that you own that's fine and if you uh, get uh, wealthy materially off of this, that's fine too. Uh, more power to you. I hope you continue in your material prosperity. However, the greatest riches we can ever have are right here. I'm pointing to the brain. Having the thinking of Christ. There, that is above and beyond uh, what uh, we can comprehend. The, the absolute uh, riches of his uh, blessings in having the thinking of Christ. Now, uh, ever since I've been uh, growing up spiritually, and uh, the more I grew up spiritually, the more I noticed I was not bored as much. A, a lot of if you get bored, as I uh, as I'm going to teach you on Sunday, if you get bored, this uh, shows there's uh, probably a kink in your spiritual life. If you ever find yourself sitting around and you say, "Man, I'm bored," well, that, that there's a problem in your thinking, because when you have the thinking of Christ, there is no reason for you to have any type of boredom. And a lot of people solve their boredom in different ways. Uh, drug abuse or excessive alcohol use or uh, a sex addict, as uh, we could call them. Or uh, somebody who gets bored goes to a bar and says, uh, uh, your place or mine. Uh, that is an indication of a bored person. Now, I can't tell you the last time I've been bored uh, as I've been uh, thinking about these doctrines, these phenomenal doctrines, and this is true wealth, and this is part of the escrow blessings for you. And you might think, uh, well, I just can't wait for that new car, or I can't wait for that new house, or the wonderful uh, financial blessings I'm going to have, not to worry about paying bills, etc., uh, but that's not what happens when you grow to maturity. In fact, you might go broke when you reach maturity. So what? You have the riches that are up here in your thinking. And you can be a billionaire and be bored out of your head, and uh, therefore you have money to try to solve that boredom. So you could get into drugs and excessive alcohol, and uh, uh, you have everybody over for a, a, a party that lasts for months. And uh, that's how you try to solve your boredom. And then uh, a lot of times... Uh, these uh, very wealthy people, if you haven't noticed from television, they end up committing suicide or they end up in jail on some drug charge. And um, usually these uh, wealth, the wealth of this uh, earth that is corruptible. And uh, if you don't have capacity for wealth, don't. Uh, I, I feel sorry for you if you receive uh, human wealth, a lot of money, when you don't have the capacity for it because you'll end up just like these people. And they actually, it becomes a com compounding of misery for you to be wealthy. And that might be why I've never been wealthy, is because God knows uh, that maybe I would go uh, nuts with the money. I doubt it, but uh, you know, God knows better than me. I mean, look at David. He got some power and some wealth. Look what he did.
So uh, we sh uh, now, uh, of course, working for a living, and and if you happen to get wealthy through your uh, free enterprise, the use of the free enterprise system, that does there's nothing wrong with that. And let no one ever tell you there is, because they're an evil. If they think that somehow you have money, there's something wrong with you. They're just envious and evil, and uh, those type of people disgust me. So. Uh, we see that God the Father is the grantor of our escrow blessings, and uh, that means uh, the thinking of Christ. And therefore, uh, all boredom in life uh, should... Uh, the, the amount of time that you spend in boredom when you have the thinking of Christ is about nil. And the, unless, of course, you, you get out of fellowship, then, of course, uh, boredom can creep in back into your life. And uh, as I said, I can't remember the last time I've been bored. Well, let me take that back. There, uh, let's see. There have been some times when I've been around uh, some of my relatives, I have gotten bored. But that's my fault. Don't blame the relative. That's my fault. Uh, I, I should have been uh, thinking. And Well, I was thinking. I wasn't thinking the right stuff. I was thinking, how do I get the hell out of here? That's what I was thinking. But... Uh, that boredom was my fault. So anytime you're, you're bored, you can see there's a kink or maybe you need to get back in fellowship or, uh, and you need to ha have the thinking of Christ. And with the thinking of Christ, part of the escrow blessing is a, a complete lack of boredom in your life. And that's a wonderful thing. So God the Father is the master plan of the protocol plan. And the protocol plan is the plan God has devised for our unique spiritual life. The next point is the indwelling of God the Son. The indwelling of God the Son is taught in John 14.30. It's taught in John 14.30, John 17.22-23, John 17.22-23, Romans 8.10, Romans 8.10, 2 Corinthians 13.5, 2 Corinthians 13.5. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's taught in Galatians 2.20. It's taught in Colossians 1.27 and 1 John 2.24. Christ indwells the body of the believer as the escutcheon of the royal family of God. He is the Shekinah glory to guarantee blessing to the believer. And by the way, the fact that God the Son indwells us guarantees us eternal security. So the fact God the Father indwells us and we see now God the Son indwells us. God the Son, that's right, the one who hung on the cross for all of us and screamed out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he was forsaken for you and for me. And a part of that, as a result of that, and when you believe in Christ as a part of what he did on the cross, you actually have God the Son. The same God, the Son, who did that for us on the cross, indwelling you. So it's time to wake up and get with this unique spiritual life. It's time to wake up and get away from legalism. It's time to wake up and start growing in grace and in knowledge and making the Word of God number one in your life. No more uh, sitting around playing with your nails while the teaching of the Word of God is going on. You want to take this into your soul because you know the phenomenal grace God has given to us. The very fact that in our mortal bodies exists the indwelling of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is phenomenal. So it's time to get with the unique spiritual life. The indwelling of God the Holy Spirit is taught in Romans 8.11. The indwelling of God the Holy Spirit is taught in Romans 8.11. It's taught in 1 Corinthians 3.16. 1 Corinthians 3.16. It's taught in 1 Corinthians 6.19-20. 1 Corinthians 6.19-20. It's, it's taught in 2 Corinthians 6.16. The Holy Spirit indwells us to make our bodies a temple for the indwelling of Jesus Christ as the Shekinah glory, as well as to provide a power base for our unique spiritual life. God the Holy Spirit teaches us doctrine. That's found in John 14, 26, John 16, 12 through 14, and 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 16. And if you find yourself for some reason not motivated in your spiritual life, 
you might want to check and check on the fact and see if you've been uh, utilizing rebound consistently. You might want to check up and make sure that you're naming your sins about every five seconds because if you're not having any type of uh, motivation in your life, then God the Holy Spirit is being quenched and squelched. And that's why you have no motivation. When you're filled with God the Holy Spirit, you have the motivation to learn the unique spiritual life. You have that motivation. You are not turned off by learning doctrine. It turns you on and it makes you want to listen and listen and listen to the Word of God until you have it in your soul so strongly that uh, you will never again have to suffer from prolonged boredom or any of the superficial, silly things Christians are going through today. You will have that wonderful escrow blessings, that wonderful wealth in your soul. Now, some of these things you might not understand as this is a basic series, but that's fine. I'm trying to motivate you right now. I'm trying to let you see what you have available to you. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit indwell you for a reason. And that reason is so that you might execute this unique spiritual life. And in fact, you have the actual power of God the Holy Spirit helping you to do so. So when you function in the spiritual life, you are functioning under the very power of God. And I hope you understand this. I hope it makes you get with it. Stop worrying about uh, making a lot of money. Don't worry about it. If you're going to make it, fine, but don't worry about it. There are far, far greater things to be uh, uh, concerned about. And you can be concerned about your spiritual life. And that is where, where true wealth is. That is where true happiness is. You think a million bucks will make you any happier? Well, it'll, it'll stimulate you for a while, maybe a month. Uh, and, and then after that, it, it's gone. Whatever stimulation there was, it's gone. And then uh, you have to keep with the spiritual life. That's true happiness. And whether you're living in a trailer or living in a mansion makes no difference. When you are growing in grace and in knowledge, you have a happiness the world cannot fathom and money cannot give you. So God dwells in the heavens. There are three categories of heavens. We have the earth and the atmosphere around the earth. God dwells uh, in three categories in the heavens, and the heavens include the earth and the atmosphere around the earth. There's the stellar universe, which includes the planets. And there is the third heaven, and that is outside of the universe. There is, therefore, the principle of the omnipresence of God. God in his eternal and infinite essence is everywhere. God is everywhere in eternal and infinite essence. Point two. This, is, this has been reduced to two categories uh, with two words. And these two words are eminence and transcendence. Eminence, I-M-M-A-N-E-N-C-E, I-M-M-A-N-E-N-C-E, and transcendence, T-R-A-N-S-C-E-N-D-E-N-C-E. So the incomparable divine transcendence is eternally prior to and exalted above the universe which he created. Of course, God created the universe, so God trans transcends and is prior to the existence of the universe. God existed before the universe. God in the total of his divine essence is above and beyond the universe and at the same time indwells and fills the universe. Transcendence means that the whole of God is superior to the out to and outside of the universe. Transcendence, uh, get this down, transcendence means that the whole of God is superior to and outside of the universe. Therefore, we have the phrase third heaven, which is found in 2 Corinthians 12.2. 2 Corinthians 12.2. Eminence means that God fills space with his presence sustaining it and giving it value. God is omnipresent and ubiquitous. Now this doesn't this isn't a, re a reference to uh, pantheism. Pantheism says that God's a stone, a tree, a mountain. This is a, a lot of what the Japanese and uh, some of the other Asian countries practice uh, God being a stone, so they worship a stone or a tree or they worship nature. This came about in uh, Europe 
what they I forget what movement they called it. I, it's been a while since I've been in school. I should remember these things. But pantheism says that God is a stone, a tree, or a mountain. So if you go out, go out here on the Blue Ridge Parkway and you look at Mount Mitchell and you say there's God, well, this is pantheism. Panthe, pantheism divide, denies the person of God. Omnipresence refers to all three persons of the Trinity. And Jesus Christ holds the universe together. And in fact, Jesus Christ controls human history. And right now, Jesus Christ is allowing us to continue as a client nation under the principle of grace. Because we definitely don't deserve it or earn it. Not now. Not the way I've seen the uh, per, per, uh, pervasion, the... Uh, uh, Oh, I don't know the word I'm looking for. The uh, permeance, that's right. The permeance of negative volition. The, the fact that uh, almost every believer, down to the one, is negative toward the word of God. And that fact does not bode well for our country. And Jesus Christ can hold, controls history. And that is the only thing I take solace in. So unless there's a turnaround, unless there's a new generation that gets some fire under their butt and wants to learn the word of God, this country is going to remain in trouble. So you need to get with the unique spiritual life. And I don't understand why people don't. It, it, it does not, I can't comprehend it. Because within the, these uh, doctrines of the word of God, within the word of God are the answers to all of life's problems. And the fact that no one wants it or they want to hold to a uh, stupid form of the spiritual life, which is not the spiritual life, uh, actually what they're doing is holding on to their own arrogance. They think they can be spiritual by the energy of the flesh. Yet, as we note here, the, the spiritual life is far beyond that. And what can you do in the flesh when you have the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, God the Son, and God the Father? Don't you understand? Um, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit, not the energy of the flesh. So it's time to get with the unique spiritual life. It's time to really get with it and dig into it so that you can come to a point of having phenomenal blessing. And you say, y you sound angry. I'm not angry. I'm trying to jolt you and, and, and trying to show you that there is... Uh, Ever heard of something called tough love? And your parents don't. When you do something wrong, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be your parent. I'm trying to teach you the word. But when you do something wrong as a child, your parents uh, may seem angry with you. But the fact is, they are uh, utilizing something called tough love. Uh, they love you, and they want to see you go on the right track. In most cases, in, in some cases, that is not correct. But in most cases, they want to see you go on the right track. And therefore, they might raise their voice at you or they might uh, uh, punish you in some way in order to get your attention so that you can orient to life. Well, I want you to orient to your spiritual life. I want you to understand that this is the most important thing in your life. And if it's not, you have a spiritual problem. Now, I can't make you do anything. I have no intention to. God has given us volition. That means you have freedom. Freedom to accept or reject or neglect what is being taught. Freedom. Complete and utter freedom. I would have it no other way. And I don't know if any of this steps on your toes. I don't know you personally. I, I don't know. I, I know my family personally. And that's about it. I don't know you personally. And uh, it's probably it's, it's best that I uh, don't know you that intimately because... I don't want any of you to think that I am uh, picking on you or that I am uh, intentionally stepping on your toes. The things that I teach, I've laid out uh, what I'm going to teach uh, before I even know who's going to show up. And, uh, I lay out what I'm going to teach uh, at, least, uh, at least a week or even uh, eventually it's going to be two to three to four weeks. In advance, I'll have what's going to be taught on Sunday uh, way before Sunday arrives. In fact, uh, the messages that you will receive this Sunday were uh, already created by uh, Sunday evening of last week. So, the fact is, I'm not uh, keeping up with your life. 
you're not that imp- well you are important but what I'm saying is I'm not uh, personally involved in your life and I shouldn't be and pastors that do get personally involved in your life uh, well that poses a problem and the fact is if you come or not that's none of my business if you listen or not it's none of my business but when you're in my presence and if you are listening I want to try to motivate you to move on that's part of exhortation I want to exhort you to live this unique spiritual life. And I'm not yelling at you uh, for the heck of it. I just, I'm not really yelling. It's, I'm passionate about these things because they're very important. And a lot of times, the only time uh, anybody will listen is if uh, they get shouted at every once in a while. If I were monotone like this all the time, and I taught to you the Word of God, and I said... Uh, God indwells every believer. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit dwells, indwells in every believer. Amen. And in every believer, the Trinity dwells. Amen. And so you have a unique spiritual life. Amen. If I were to teach you like that, you would fall asleep within about three minutes. And you should. And and by the way, I I watched a mass. I don't know why. A mass. Not a mass as in a growth on a human, but a mass in terms of uh, what they have in the Catholic Church. I was <laughs> I was about to say I was bored, and I decided to watch a mass. That's not true. I wasn't bored, but I did want to see the mass and see what that was, what they do, and they uh, genuflex up and down and all of these things. And then uh, a priest gets up there with a very high pitched voice, and and they think they're being real spiritual, and uh, and I think um, it would be a good sleep aid for people who have insomnia. Just turn on the mass at midnight, you know, and you'll be asleep in three minutes. So there, I'm not trying to put you to sleep. That's the point I'm making. Uh, when I uh, use a little voice inflection, it's not because I'm angry. I'm not. It's because I want you to uh, keep a concentration. It's hard to concentrate for an hour straight. And in order to concentrate, see, you listen, is you have to use a little voice inflection. And if you don't, then uh, if a pastor doesn't, he's going to be uh, hard to listen to. But, of course, there are different personalities, and uh, and uh, and that's just the way uh, God has designed it. But there is a way that the Word of God has to be taught, and it has to be taught in such a way that uh, you understand the importance of it. And if I talk like this all the time, I might say that what I am telling you is very important, but you wouldn't understand that. So therefore, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity, Father, to study your word. Thank you for letting us understand the Trinity and the abode of God and the fact that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit indwell each of us as believers in Christ. And may our knowledge of that be a point of motivation in our life to get with the word of God, to grow in grace and in knowledge so that we might experience the the wondrous joys, the unalloyed joy of having the word of God resident in our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.